In this episode of Building a Monster Truck Engine, I'm going to show you how adding just one component to this supercharged 7 liter D-Max will decrease the boost and increase the horsepower. Welcome back to Dino Cell number one here at Banks Power. I'm Gail Banks. In the last episode, we ran this five liter Whipple supercharger, which kicked ass on the GMC 1071 we ran in the episode before that. Since then, the guys have removed the Whipple supercharger and mounted our new air density machine. Our new air density machine is this Whipple intercooler, and this thing is a monster. Unlike the air-to-air -air intercooler in most cars and trucks, this one is liquid coupled. It's similar to the setup on the Ford 6-7 liter diesels, only this one is on steroids. Here's how it works. Water flows through the core to absorb the heat. Then much like your engine's radiator, the water flows through a very large low temp radiator to cool it. Since there's water flowing through the core inside the intake manifold, we decided to pressure test the installed core with air. We wanted to make sure it wouldn't leak water into the cylinders. Water doesn't compress real well, you know. It passed with flying colors, holding 25 PSI for 30 minutes with no loss, so we were good to go. Pushing the water through the intercooler system will be a pair of billet aluminum Stewart EMP pumps, which depending on the head pressure required, will run in parallel for more volume or in series for greater pressure, as you can see on this photo of our water pump test stand. We've used the Stewart EMP pumps for more than 15 years. I love the straight through design. Today on this test series, we'll be running a water flow rate of 36 gallons per minute. I'm looking for a maximum water temp gain through the core of 20 degrees Fahrenheit at full power. So this is just a starting point. We first used liquid coupled intercooling on our marine offshore racing engines back in 1975. These were dual core intercooled, twin turbo, dual quad gasoline fueled big block Chevys. First use in a car was Roy Wood's Imsa Monza in 1976. I think you get the idea. We've been doing this liquid intercooling stuff for more than a minute. So what's the point of all this? I'm gonna show you how an intercooler makes more horsepower or greater fuel economy without changing anything other than adding intercooling. For our first test, we won't mess with the blower speed or add any fuel. I'm not touching anything. I'm just adding the intercooling. We'll be testing at 3,200 RPM with the blower at 50% over or 4,800 RPM. The power was 235 horsepower testing at a 23 to one air fuel ratio and 14 pounds of boost without the intercooler. What I'm duplicating here is the power output that would be required pulling a serious load up a 6% grade. Hey, you wanna see this thing run? Let's jump into the control room and bark this pup. As part of this monster truck engine series, I'm revealing a new intercooler rating system. And it's a subject of two new patents covering charge air monitoring and charge air control that we filed on February the 8th of 2019. We call it Banks IRS and these new readings will be included in all I dash super gauge and iDash Data Monster instruments at no additional charge. Using Banks IRS, what you can read is remarkable. The bottom line is this, a proper intercooler can contribute as much horsepower as the supercharger or the turbocharger. All right, Aaron, let's turn on the Data Monster and run this thing. Logging's active. We're not only logging everything on those screens, we're logging about a hundred different parameters on, a, on that one SD card right now. We're gonna come up to about 3,200, here we come. Go. All right. Okay. 
Okay, we can bring it down. Let's turn off the logger and uh, please pass me that SD card. Once it's done, there it is. Okay, we've ran runs two and three and all that data is on this micro SD card. Before we jump into the data, I wanted to talk intercoolers for a second. Compared at the same horsepower and RPM, an intercooler makes a supercharger's or a turbocharger's job easier but all intercoolers are not created equal. Higher efficiency intercoolers on spark ignited engines allow more horsepower before hitting the detonation limit of the fuel. On diesel engines, they allow more horsepower before hitting the EGT limit or overheating the coolant. And when cruising or working, they increase fuel economy. Here's what I'm saying. The intercooler sweeps up after the compressor. If you work your truck, especially at higher altitudes, the stock intercooler chokes up pretty quickly and can't dump heat fast enough. This causes an increase in EGT, exhaust gas temperatures, and an increase in coolant temperatures, which lead to power D rates. What does that mean? It means the engine pulls out fuel to save itself and the turbo. That gives you less power and lower fuel economy right when you need it. Some aftermarket intercoolers we've tested look great on the flow bench, but turn out to be worse than stock on a high power pull at sustained load. In my opinion, those things are pure bling, designed by companies using incomplete testing equipment and very little talent. MAD, Manifold Air Density, determines how many pounds of air mass is contained in every thousand cubic feet displaced by the cylinders. The air mass is mixed with the fuel at optimum air fuel ratio and you produce power. Here's what I'm saying. Intercooler efficiency is a very big player when it comes to making power. To most people, power lasts five to 10 seconds and it's over. But not in my world. In my world, guys pull long grades with heavy loads. That requires an efficient intercooler that has massive cooling capacity and very little boost pressure loss. Our competition sells intercoolers based mainly on flow bench numbers and half-assed short duration dyno sweeps. Well, that doesn't cut it. The gold standard is full power, long duration testing in the vehicle with the ability to measure the intercooler efficiency on the road. Intercooler efficiency includes effectiveness, the ability to dump heat, and it includes the pressure loss caused when forcing the boost air through the core. The goal is to improve air density. A boost gauge can't read that because it doesn't know a damn thing about heat. I've done a little science fair project to demo that. This is a welded, sealed cubic foot of air. There's no air going in, there's no air coming out. We've heated it using this hot plate to duplicate a blower, building some heat in the intake manifold and making some boost. In this case, the air density inside this cubic foot is 73.2 pounds per thousand cubic feet Temperature's 188 degrees Fahrenheit, and the boost is 3.3 PSI gauge. Now we're going to intercool this. If everything goes right, we'll have the same air density, but no pressure. So let's intercool it. Heat's off. All right, let's speed up the clock and watch the temperature and the boost drop. All right, the air density is still 73.2 pounds per thousand. We had 3.3 pounds of boost when we started and the temp was 188 degrees. Now the boost is zero and the temp is 67 degrees. But the air density is still the same, so the boost lied to us. So what we have here is the world's most inefficient compressor. It added boost pressure, sure, but it also added temperature. Enough that even with a boost reading, there's no gain in air density, so there would be no gain in horsepower. Here's the takeaway. 
you can increase boost and see no increase in air density. Therefore, your boost gauge is bogus. So you've just seen that chilling the air allows the same mass to occupy the same volume at lower pressure. That's the job of a high efficiency intercooler, which we've been building for over 50 years. And our new intercooler rating system measures both effectiveness and efficiency, which is just something no one has ever put on a gauge until now. High efficiency intercoolers increase horsepower and torque, improve fuel efficiency, and improve lubricant life, thereby improving engine life. That's why high efficiency intercoolers are so important. I know this segment's about Duramax, but I want to show you a couple of my favorite Ram intercoolers. The 6.7, the early 6.7 and 5.9. We've got two different things going on here. On the 13 up 6.7, the intercooler breathes beneath the radiator. This guy, we've increased to six inches thick, but we've kept the fin density so the airflow through can really pull out the BTUs, really pull out the heat. And I've really worked with the guys to get the manifold design on each end so they flow in and out like a mother. And we've gone big on the boost tubes. And of course, our monster rams are becoming the stuff of legend. On the earlier engines, we've increased the thickness of the intercooler, but here's a, here's a cautionary tale. If you get too thick or your fin density is wrong, the air can't get through to the engine cooling radiator sitting behind this pup. As a result, you might have a lot of intercooling in, until the engine overheats and pulls out fuel. So, the bigger intercooler, a lot of them do this, by the way. Ours do not. We're wise to that game. We measure the air flow through the stock intercooler, and we make sure that ours has at least that much. We're not going to derate the engine by overtemping the coolant with our big ass intercooler. So, with our intercoolers, we do three things we minimize pressure drop between the turbocharger and the intake manifold. We maximize cooling and we maximize airflow through on the cold side so your radiator can do its job. Remember, you're making more power. So this is real important. Oh, and Mishimoto, AFE, BD, and the rest of you guys, if you'd like to know how your intercoolers perform, we'll be happy to sell you the instrumentation to measure them. Or you can just wait for my videos. Okay, let's jump back into the control room and take a look at the data on the liquid coupled Whipple. So the last episode, running the Whipple with no intercooler, was test series number one. I'll be referring to that. Two and three, we just ran. The comparisons are shocking. I mean, let me give you some numbers here. In test number one, we had 14 pounds of boost coming out of the Whipple supercharger. That in tests two and three has dropped to 8.9 pounds of boost coming out of the Whipple. That's 35% less boost. On test number one, the temperature in the intake manifold was 279 degrees Fahrenheit. On tests two and three with the intercooler in place, that temperature is 79 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 72% less temperature in the intake manifold. So what about manifold air density? In test number one, our manifold air density was 102.5 pounds per thousand cubic feet. In tests two and three, that went up 14% to 117.1 pounds per thousand cubic feet. Now bear in mind, all these tests are run at 3,200 RPM part throttle. We're down on boost 35%. We're down on temperature 72%, but we're up 14% on manifold air density. Okay, our second sheet 
is test one versus test two. This is intercooler only. No additional fuel has been added. Nothing else has changed. Test one, the mass airflow was 37 and a half pounds per minute. Test two, the mass airflow went up 4.8% to 39.3 pounds per minute. How can that be? Well, here's what's going on. The air under the blower has been condensed. Basically, it's higher density now. It's almost like the blower thinks the engine is bigger. Uh, that's what intercoolers do. They let the blower do the same mass flow job and it, or actually improve it slightly because they've unloaded the blower and the blower's pressure ratio is lower. It's heating the air less. And in the process through the blower, you're getting higher mass flow. It's like a freebie, damn near 5%. Looking at the air fuel ratio on test number one, we calibrated it 23 to one, kind of the air fuel ratio you'd expect pulling a heavy load and producing horsepower in the mid 200s. On test two, due to the additional mass flow the system is now providing, it's leaned out to 25 to one. So what about the horsepower? Well, the horsepower on test number one was 235 horsepower. The horsepower on test number two is 252. That's up 7.4%. It gained 17 horsepower on the same fuel. Are you starting to get the drift? You can now back out of the throttle and produce 235 horsepower with less fuel than you did before you installed the intercooler. Let's go to test one versus test three. Same math, same mass airflow, 39.3. But what we did here was we made the air fuel ratio the same. Now you might ask, where did that 17 horsepower come from on the previous sheet? That came from a reduction in parasitic horsepower because the blower is now doing a higher mass flow with 17 less horsepower. There's where the fuel economy thing comes from. That, that parasitic horsepower reduction allows you to make more horsepower at the flywheel on the same fuel. Now we're gonna match the fuel rate on this one. We're at 23 to one on both tests, one and three. The horsepower on test number one was 235. The horsepower on test three is 278. Same air fuel ratio, just more air mass. So we've got an 18.3% gain in horsepower. That's 43 horsepower. 17 of that we know came from the parasitic reduction. We subtract that out and we're getting 26 horsepower additional at the same air fuel ratio. That's a net gain of 11.1%. And if you think about it, if you compare that to the increase in manifold air density of 14%, you can see how the gain here on test three of 11.1% is tracking the 14% gain in manifold air density. You couldn't predict any of this by the boost pressure. The boost pressure went down a hell of a lot. That would predict less horsepower, wouldn't it, boost freaks? Uh-uh, boost gauges are stone age. Okay, here on sheet number four, we're gonna get to the air density and where the hell it came from. On test number one, the ambient air density is 69.6 .6 pounds per thousand. The boost air density is 32.9 pounds per thousand and the manifold air density is 102.5 pounds per thousand cubic feet. Add plus bad equals mad. On tests two and three, we've got two density machines contributing, the supercharger and the intercooler. And in this case, believe it or not, the intercooler is outperforming the supercharger. Let's run the numbers. Ambient air density is down a little bit, 69.3 pounds per thousand. 
the supercharger is making 9.1 pounds of boost at, at its outlet with a temperature of 230. Get this, it's making lower boost and lower temperature, which makes the job of the intercooler a bit easier. It's making 23.1 pounds per thousand. The intercooler is making 24.7 pounds per thousand. It loses two tenths of a pound of boost. So the boost coming out of the intercooler is 8.9 pounds and the temperature is down to 79 degrees. The two of those combined gives us the boost air density, which is 47.8 pounds per thousand. And our final in the intake manifold number is 117.1 pounds per thousand. So who contributed what? The ambient air density is responsible for 59% of the MAD. The supercharger air density, 20% of the MAD. The intercooler air density, 21% of the MAD. So combined, 41% of the manifold air density comes from the boosting system and the rest comes from good old mother nature. When we're all done, the boost is 8.9, the temperature is 79 degrees, and the air density is up 14% over no intercooler. So what we've got here is a boosting system that has a 45% increase in density from 32.9 to 47.8, combined with a 36% reduction in boost. Who knew? This is my thermal sheet. Manifold air temperature, test one to test two, is down 200 degrees. So the air in the intake manifold is one hell of a lot cooler going into the intake ports. The EGT, kind of follows the reduction in intake air temperature. This always happens. The EGT was 1,042 degrees. Now it's 903 degrees on test two, and we're making some more horsepower, remember that. It's pretty easy to understand the exhaust temp going down. If, it's, if the air is 200 degrees cooler going in, you'd expect a reduction in the exhaust temperature. But there's an added benefit the reduction in heat rejected into the coolant. Test one, 1,090 BTUs per 100 horsepower being produced. Test two, that drops to 990 BTUs. That's a 100 BTU reduction, damn near 10% less heat being rejected into your cooling water. And how about the intercooler performance? Let's just, I've got some numbers here. This thing's liquid coupled. We were looking at air to air out in the shop a little while ago. Remember the mass airflow, 39.3 pounds per minute. We're pumping 36 gallons of water per minute through the intercooler. It's gaining 22 degrees in temperature as the water goes through the intercooler. My target was 20 for this test, so we're right there. The pressure drop, the boost loss through this intercooler is two tenths of a pound. This intercooler has a lot of overhead. And by the time we were done with this monster truck project, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a lot of that up. The temperature drop through the intercooler itself is 151 degrees. The intercooler effectiveness, this is a new measurement to, to most of you. The intercooler effectiveness is its ability to reduce temperature. It's a comparison between the cooling water or the cooling air temperature and the boost air temperature. The effectiveness of this intercooler at this power level is 95.5%. Wow, that's good. And the intercooler efficiency, a number nobody's ever talked about before, but a number you can read on the iDash IRS system, 90.6% efficient. Next sheet is fuel economy. Now, nobody cares much about fuel economy in a monster truck, but the reason I ran this in that 250 horsepower range is because if this was your truck, you'd be interested in fuel economy. And here's what's going on. The pounds per hour at full power for the baseline at 235 horsepower, 97.9 pounds of fuel per hour. 
Remember, we didn't change the fuel rate, so for test two, it's also 97.9 pounds per hour at 252 horsepower. And for test three, we match the air fuel ratio, it's 109.7 pounds per hour, stepping on it a little bit. But you've got to compare the fuel consumed per 100 horsepower to really look at what, what's going on here with fuel economy. With the 235 horsepower calibration and setup, we're burning 41.7 pounds of fuel per 100 horsepower over an hour. Test two, where we added no fuel, added air, reduced parasitics, and that gives us 252 horsepower at 38.8 pounds per 100 horsepower. That's 7% better fuel economy, guys. And then we added fuel. Here you expect to lose a little, but we didn't lose much. We're at 39.4 pounds per hour. That's 5.6% better fuel economy. We've got better fuel economy. This thing is taking load off the engine in a variety of ways, giving you more horsepower with no additional fuel or matching the air fuel ratio, giving you a whopping good increase. It's dropped temperatures all over the place and it's given you a whopping big increase in fuel economy. This is what a highly effective, highly efficient intercooler can do for you. And done right, your truck will not over temp and derate whatsoever. You'll enjoy the full ben benefits of a properly engineered aftermarket intercooler. That's our game. That's what we do. For the next step, and I know you've been waiting for this, we're adding two serious turbos from Precision and two wastegates and a blow-off valve from TurboSmart. We're going to rock and roll. If you want to see it, all you need to do is subscribe.